She will speak about sharing as an effective tool for professional development in school. Well, good day, everyone. Um, I have no slides. So, um, but um, what I would like to talk about is a little bit what sharing means for me in education and um, sharing in general how useful it can be when you work with the teachers. I work with the teachers. Um, some time ago, I used to be a teacher myself. I think it's a very important and a very honorable tradition to, um, in, in my family, because we've had uh, teachers all along the line. And, um, you know, the, the thing is, when I was asked to give this presentation, I was thinking which corner, which angle I should take in order to talk about sharing in education. And um, the, one of the things when we were discussing came up was teacher preparation. And um, I think people who come into education first have to be ready to share from day one. Uh, I think we don't have that mentality. Uh, when you walk into the schools, most of the doors are closed and teachers are working behind closed doors as if, if something heard or if something seen should not be heard or seen. And um, so starting with an open door policy, I think we should open the doors in our minds as well. So um, we should understand that only sharing can, can bring us the greatest benefits. Um, you know, we talk about Finland a lot now. There are articles about Finland and Lithuania. There are articles in Sweden about Finland. You know, um, my colleagues in Sweden are saying we're, we're kind of tired of Finland because it, it looks like, you know, everything is pointing towards Finland. But I would like to speak a little bit about Finland as well. Um, you know, the thing about Finland is that um, primary school teacher programs are so popular that only one in 10 applicants is accepted each year. You know, I even looked up the numbers if they were right, because it seems like, well, this is really, really interesting. And this is really complicated. And once I asked a Finnish professor, um, you know, what was her biggest problem? And she said that one of her biggest problems was getting the right candidates, the right people, because there were so many who were willing to become the teachers. Um, the, one of the greatest misconceptions is that um, um, into the teacher education in Finland, only the best and the brightest get into. Well, this is not true. Only the ones who are best fit for the profession get in. You can have a very great average. You can be top 5% student and you can be willing to become a teacher. But if you do not have the skills, if you do not want to be a teacher for life, if you are just looking at the teaching profession as a stepping stone, you are not accepted. I, uh, when I did my doctorate, I used to teach students would be teachers. And I asked to raise your hand anyone who put it as number one on the list of professions that they were choosing. Not a single hand went up. Of all the students who were sitting in my classroom, none of them had the first choice as teaching. They got in by chance or they were not sure or I'll try, or but it was not the first choice. And I think that's where the problems begin. Because we look at it as a stepping stone. Um, in, in Finland, when I looked up, the student cohort represents a diverse range of academic success. And deliberately so. Because we're looking at every single individual. People may have characteristics of great teachers, without having the best academic record. I have seen people who have done not so well academically, but they are fantastic teachers. Um, I've also experienced situations when the, you know, the international schools, because I work with Council of International Schools, and um, I got to accredit some international schools, and with Eastern and Central Europe, international schools used to have one problem. 
because you know parents are paying a lot of money for their child's education averages 15,000 euros a year can reach up to 30,000 euros a year so the school can pay higher salaries for the teachers and can attract very highly skilled people so there has been situations when the best piano player has become the music teacher in that school and guess what it did not work because no matter that that person was a great professional in the field but when you need to teach six-year-olds music well nobody cares about how great a piano player you are six-year-olds couldn't care less it does not impress them a bit what impresses them is how you talk to them how you get them interested whether you get them interested and how your lesson goes and whether you manage the classroom well and whether you look at each child as an individual and take them from where they need to be taken to where you want them to take and that's a huge difference and that's I think a fundamental difference in the teacher choice so I think we have to have a natural passion to teach for life in order to be a teacher so our main goal should be to find the right people and that's where we should start our sharing long before they even get into the university to actually see in the youngsters who are able to be teachers and to encourage them to do that um, and with that I will share a story with you when um, I moved into education from non-education sector and uh, I made that decision when I was old enough and conscious enough so that no one can, could influence me uh, because when I was younger I was influenced to go into something better for me how did that work that worked very well because I was 17 when I graduated and when everybody was saying you can do better than teaching I thought I would I did better than teaching well, until I got my own thinking skills. And then I realized that there is nothing better than teaching for me. And if it's something is, if law is the best thing for you, go there. If volunteer work is the best one for you, go there. Academic success does not define who we are. And we need to share that with children. So that the children who are capable to become teachers in the future start thinking that direction at an early age. And I think we are doing an awful job with that. Because when my school turned 90, there was a huge anniversary. And my father, when one of the teachers came up to my dad and said, you know, she, and she's a teacher. And she said, you know, she could have done anything. And she became a teacher and got four kids. What worse could happen? You know, so, so even among ourselves, if we teachers say things like that, what can we expect of the society? What can we expect of everyone else if this is our mentality? If we within the profession are cutting the roots for the motivated people to come and share with us. The other thing is that um, a lot of countries are talking about now, and I saw this discourse in Lithuania as well, that in Sweden, teachers are free from inspection, from standardized testing and government control, and that they all share and they all work together, and it's all peaches and rainbows. Well, can we do it, right? Can we do it? Should we just take the Finnish model and implement it in Lithuania. Finnish. I speak Swedish, so I always look at Sweden, but can we do it? No, no, we can't do it. We need to look when educational reform started in Finland. Well, that was 70s and 80s. And you know what was then when it all started? It was very strict central direction. It was control over schools. It was state prescribed curriculum. It was external inspections and detailed regulation because the state wanted to get a strong grip of what's happening in education. And everyone had a mindset that we have to get it and we have to work together. 
Do you know how long did it take to release that grip and let the decentralization take over? Guess. 20. It started in the 90s. In the 90s, the grip was released. And now we're in 2015 and we're all raving. But it takes time. Rome was not built in a day. It takes time. So if we want change, we need to realize that even the big, especially the beginning, can be very painful and very difficult. Um, the other thing is that a lot of students in Finland now, they spend 50% of their studies in university and 50% time in schools. So from the day one, they basically go into the school and that's where the experienced teachers start their sharing. And they share and they help. Because you all know, right? Fulham described that. That Fulham's dip. What happens? We all go into education and we think like, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to do the most wonderful things and I'm going to be successful and I'm going to be so much better than anybody else. And then three months later, you have the Fulham's dip. And you have the Fulham's dip because you understand Life as a teacher is not that easy. And you, un you become tired. There are lots of paperwork and so forth and so on. And the children are not rejoicing that you are teaching them. And the parents are not thankful every single day. So you become disillusioned. And that's when the other teachers have to come in and say, I've been there. I've been through this. I've been at exactly the same spot and I've doubted myself as well. I was very lucky because when I started my teaching, I worked with, um, I worked at the American school and I was the youngest. I had the support of all the teachers telling me, yes, Ostea, you can do it. It's okay. And I say, those parents don't appreciate what I do. And they say, they never appreciate, you know, and they would, they would have the inner jokes. They would have all these things that you would never tell directly to the parents, but that you can tell a colleague who is distressed, right? And this tight community of sharing and of talking and of understanding each other and of constant support pulled me through my hardest times. Because even if methodologically, we are absolutely prepared to become teachers, psychologically, we never are. <laughs> We never are, because we believe that we are prepared. But once we stand in front of that classroom of 22 children with their own personalities, with their own families, with their own backgrounds, with their own dreams and hopes, it's all different. And then you think, well, I'm here to individualize. How am I going to do that? There are too many of them. And they all have different dreams. They don't all want what I want. You know, and that's when someone experienced can come in and say, relax, you're going to be fine. You will survive, right? So those things are extremely important. And that was when um, the first thing, when we started, uh, we started with a different approach to PD, professional development. And um, because that's what I saw was the weakest link, and that's where we had to work most on. And I would like to share a couple of things that we have been doing. Uh, we have actually borrowed, um, borrowed the name from European Union and called it Erasmus. And, uh, and we are doing exchange among our teachers. So from one preschool, because now we have 15 preschools in Lithuania and one in Latvia, and what we do, the teachers have exchanged. So they have to write that they want to see how the other one is working. We look at it. If they find someone who wants to exchange from the other preschool, they exchange. Usually they come back and say, oh, I'm so happy to be back. My parents are better. My kids are better. <laughs> That's the first thing they say. Because, you know, when you are with your own kids, you don't appreciate how well you know them, how much you love them, and so on and so forth. But then you go to another classroom, and you see that things don't work like they used to work in my classroom. And then you start appreciating the little things. So to raise the teacher's motivation, we have started that, and it has really gotten going, and it, it's, it's worked wonderful. The other thing, what we call, we have a calling team. That's our name. And uh, um, our team is to help and support. 
So we selected 10 of our teachers who are coming in every quarter. Every teacher is visited. Because again, the teachers, especially the, 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 the beginners, the young ones, they feel left out. They feel like sometimes I don't know who to go to, but if I go to, I may look unprofessional. And I don't want to look unprofessional because I have a degree, so you know, everybody will think that I'm an idiot. You know, well, no, nobody will think that you're an idiot, but you know, it's, it's okay to have challenges. So what we do is that you know, the professional team comes in it took us years to tell them that it's not inspection to punish them. Because the first attitude was like, oh, you know, what are they going to find? What are they going to look for? We're coming in to help. We are here to support you. If we thought that you were not a good teacher, you would not be working with us. So the idea that you are working means that you are at least good enough. But we are here to help you to become better. Um, and... Um, so every single quarter, the classroom is visited. So four times a year, you have a, a, a more experienced teacher to come and stay with you all full day. And at the end of the day, sit down with you and say, you know what? I saw you do it this way. You can do it that way. Have you considered this way? How about this? How about that? And they write it all down for the future reference. Um, the other thing what we organize, we regularly organize job alike. What's a job alike? It's professional discussions. You know, the research on teachers' professional development proves again and again and again that no outside expert can bring as much professional development as the teachers themselves. Once they start talking, because who knows better what we need for our particular school than us? We work there. We know how everything works. We know all the bits and bats. We know everything. So why don't we sit down? The teachers don't have time to sit down and talk about it. But once they have time to sit down and talk about it, they start sharing. What we have noticed in the beginning, they were like, okay, who's going to say something? So what are you going to say about this? What should we say about this? And I'm like, say whatever. Start talking. Start talking. And once they start talking, they don't want to stop. Then it's a problem to stop them. You know, th that's the thing. Because job alikes are a fantastic tool to get them talking and solving problems. Because within your circle, you always have the answer. You always have the answer. It's very rare. It's very seldom that you have to go out of your circle to look for an answer. Most of the time, you can find it within. Um, the other thing what we have done, we have digitalized our resources and they're on online in our internet. And they can look it up, they can go back, we film all our seminars, we film all our PD opportunities, so they can always look, look, go back and look it up to refresh the memory, to, to, to look through the things that they wanted to see again and again. Um, we have implemented ESA standards, International Step-by-Step -Step Association, which also helps teachers to know clearly what are the objectives. Because then they feel like they are not measured by what God knows what measures. They know exact measures that they will be measured by. And, um, and that's the other thing that really takes out the stress. Um, the, the thing what I struggle with is that, um, you know, we have a teacher academy. And in the very beginning, it was very difficult to get the teachers come in and understand that if they don't come in all together and if they don't start sharing, if they don't start talking, then we're going to grow stale. Because you cannot stop where you are. Lifelong learning is about lifelong learning. You know, it's not something that you have to teach the children. If you are not a lifelong learner yourself, there's no way you're going to teach your children. Last year, we had, a, um, we had a young teacher who came after getting her degree in primary education, and I was interviewing her, and I asked, you know, um, you know, in our organization, you'll have to study a lot. We have Teachers Academy, we have Jumbo Likes, we have Colentine, we have Erasmus, we have all those things. You're going to work hard. Are you, are you ready to come into this? And she said, but I've just graduated. And I said, oh, 
you're 22. <laughs> what do you mean? I just graduated. You know, so that's, that's the attitude. So I think we need to change the attitude towards just getting a degree to the attitude that we should never stop learning and we should never stop sharing what we have learned. It has to be a continuous process. Uh, we have also started a new program where all teachers who go to some outside lecture or conference or anything, when they come back, they need to give the lecture. Well, before, it was not very successful. When, then we installed one draconian measure. We pay for it, but if you don't teach the teachers when you get back, you reimburse us. All started to share. <laughs> so, you know, so in the beginning, it was kind of trying to find the way how to get them. And it's like with Finland. First, you have to set the situation right and not just be upset that it's not working. Find the way to work it. Find the way to work it. And we still struggle. We have not solved all the problems, but every day we think like we are moving forward. And um, um, I really like your idea about uh, atypical certifications because some of our teachers have said that the certificate of our teacher's academy is worth more than their degree sometimes. And it's, you know, you take it as a great compliment, but it's all within, within the capacity. So, um, and the last thing what we did, we, we took out the teachers who were passionate about certain subjects and we did them core coordinators. So their core, because we have four cores in our schools, and that's emotional intelligence, that's IT and mathematics, but we call it together mathematics. Uh, we have science, and we have literacy. So these are the core strands of our education. And um, we got a coordinator for each of those strands. And those teachers uh, get extra paid for extra hours, but those extra hours are put in for them to do research in those subjects. So they either read articles, read books, analyze the situation, go to the conferences, observe, and it's a weekly exercise. It's not like once a year they present something. Every single week they come up with something that they can share with the rest of the community, and we do that uh, on the internet, intranet. And what we have noticed is that in the beginning there were like no reactions. You know, they would do something and it's quiet. They would do something and it's quiet. And we were wondering whether anyone was actually reading it or paying attention to it. But two months down the line, and they started to share. And they started to talk about it. And they started to thank those core coordinators for the ideas that they've come up, for the things that they've showed for the direction that they pointed. So, you know, uh, when it comes down, I think that we have to understand that there is no educational process that can be effective without teachers sharing. It has to become not an exceptional thing, but a norm. Because I think the more we share, the more we share in our schools, in our cities, in our countries, and within our countries, the more effective our education systems will be. Because no matter how good it is in Finland, we are not Finland. We have to find the right way for us and what would work for us. So um, um, I usually read my books when I'm walking. And uh, um, I read Kindle books. And, and how I learned, you know, I think how I learned most of the things. And I was just thinking during your presentation that um, when I understood that I need marketing skills, I went online, I went to Harvard, I looked at all the books you have to read in order to get a marketing degree in Harvard, and I read them all. But the best part was that I was talking to the people who are specialists in marketing for them and asking them to explain me how they did that in practice. And I can say that it's the same 
with education. If you just go to school and you learn, you learn about Montessori, you learn about Steiner, you learn about classroom behavior management and so on and so forth, it's segmented. It becomes whole only when you start operating, when you start working with it, when you start trying it out. So when we teach our two and three year olds that learning should be hands-on, it never changes. It just doesn't. The best learning is hands-on. And hands-on is when we do things together. Because you all know very well that parallel play starts at around three. Then we start working together. So um, I think when we understand that, and when our mindset changes from individual players to playing together, we can achieve the things that we have never dreamed of achieving. Thank you very much.